be. Next, I'd like to introduce Josh Wright. Thanks so much, Brian. Uh, uh, I had a chance to talk to Brian yesterday about some of the capabilities of Veracode, and I'd used Veracode at a uh, former employer, a uh, startup in San Jose, but I was not aware that Veracode did a lot of the mobile app analysis stuff. And, and what I tell my students in my mobile security class is there's just not enough time in the day for you to analyze all the applications that you're using in your organization. So uh, I was uh, really happy to learn that somebody is uh, doing a lot of this analysis work and uh, getting really good results. So I'm uh, excited to follow up with Brian and follow, find out more about that. So um, I just wanted to say welcome everybody. Thank you to SANS. Thank you to Veracode for giving us a chance to uh, talk today about the stage fray issues and what's going on. So a quick introduction. I'm going to talk about five specific topics in my portion of the webcast here. I'm going to do a, an overview of the stage fray vulnerability. Uh, what we know, I'm going to remove conjecture and rumor, and I'm going to cite everything that we're talking about. Uh, there's still some stuff that we don't know, but I think there's a lot of important things that people need to know that are not being widely covered in the press and in other sources. I'm going to talk about how to detect vulnerable devices, how to know what your exposure is. Uh, we're going to talk about some countermeasures and the status of pat uh, patching, and I'm going to spend a couple of minutes pontificating, reflecting on the Android ecosystem. Um, and then we're going to end with some practical advice for responding to stage fright. And when Sans asked me if I would do this presentation last week, I uh, it was funny because the message came in while I had browsers on all three of the monitors on my desk. I had about 18,000 tabs open in my um, web browser. I you know, had Twitter going, I had all these different things going, and, and I'm trying to pull together in, just for myself at that time, trying to understand what is the real deal on stage fright and, and what's going on. So again, just thank you to Verico, thank you to Sans for the chance to be able to bring you this information so you don't have to scour through hundreds of random blogs and tweets. So let's talk about stage fright. Stage fright is a vulnerability identified by Josh Drake of Zimperium, and uh, he racked up several CVE entries for this particular vulnerability. It represents multiple buffer overflow flow vulnerabilities in the Android Stage Fright media library. The media library is called Stage Fright, which is where the name comes from. And this media library uh, triggers these vulnerabilities when it opens maliciously crafted MP4 video files. And this is where we saw a lot of the press talking about, uh, you know, uh, 980 million people vulnerable to stage fright, uh, 950 million people vulnerable to stage fright, and this MMS delivery vector where somebody sends you an MMS with an attached video file, and then depending on the status of your uh, MMS client, you uh, get owned by just watching the video or just opening the video. Now there's some truth and there's some fiction to that and I want to break some of those different issues out. We do know that these vulnerabilities are real in stage fright. In the Android open source tree we're seeing patches for these vulnerabilities. We know that they are being addressed. Um, we also know that the code that is vulnerable has existed for quite some time, starting in Android 2.2 all the way through the most recent Android release 5.1, which is an estimated 950 million Android users. So let's talk about the stage fright delivery vector. Now, uh, uh, Joshua Drake's presentation and uh, other media sources are citing, uh, somebody sends you uh, this crafted MP4 file and an MMS message, you retrieve the message, maybe you don't even watch the video, just your uh, MMS client retrieving the message is enough to trigger the vulnerabilities and to get the Android device exploited. Now, there is a bunch of nuance here that's important to articulate. Because of the flexibility of the Android platform, it's difficult to characterize exactly which MMS applications will trigger this vulnerability without even watching the video, just upon receipt of the video. So recently, and by recently I mean today, uh, Google has released new versions of Hangouts and Google Messenger, which has been updated. 
Now, the vulnerability stage fright is not an app level vulnerability, it's a system level vulnerability, so it can't be addressed with just an app update, but what Google's done is they're trying to mitigate some of this impact, and they've updated Hangouts and Messenger so that they do not process media files automatically. So there is a step between receiving a malicious MP4 file and opening the malicious MP4 file where an end user who has some training, maybe they don't recognize the sender, they can say, I'm not gonna open this message and then it won't trigger the vulnerability. And that's tremendous. It's not a fix, but it's, it's tremendously good and, and Google's doing some good things to help us with this issue. However, stage fright can be delivered in other ways as well. So I've got a little HTML5 code on the bottom of the page here. Video autoplay tag in HTML5 will start loading an MP4 file that's referenced automatically. If you browse to a site with an exploit and you open a web page, it can trigger the vulnerability automatically. So dispel the notion of this is an MMS related vulnerability. It is not. It's a core library vulnerability that can be exploited anytime you open a MP4 file that's malicious, regardless of how that MP4 file got to you. So what else do we know? We know that uh, Josh Drake has replaced, has released some proof of concept crash MP4s. So uh, Zimperium released a zip file. There was eight or nine different MP4 files in there for different platforms. And in my testing and other people are confirming as well, they do crash some versions of Android devices. Others don't crash, but that's not to say there's not a vulnerability, um, but they, they are reliably reproducing crashes in the stage fright library. They have yet to disclose or release an exploit. There is no source code, there is no Python script that says, at least publicly available, that you can run that uh, starts auto-rooting a bunch of Android devices. In a video Drake posted on YouTube, he does appear to have a Python script. We don't know anything else about it other than what's on the screen here, but he's able to get a shell and he's able to get more than normal app user functionality because of the privileged level of the stage, stage fright library. Now, interesting to note as well, the commercial software, Vuln Disco, and Vuln Disco is part of the um, it's, it's an add-on exploit set for the ImmunitySec Canvas tool. Canvas is a pen tester exploitation tool or, or perhaps just exploitation tool, commercial product. I've not seen the Vuln Disco software. They do not specifically cite what platforms, what versions of Android they have support for in their exploit, but they are claiming that they have their own exploit shortly following Joshua Drake's presentation. So if you're a Canvas customer, you can buy the Vuln Disco add-on pack and get access to that software. And if, and if you are a Vuln Disco customer, I'd love to hear what your experiences are with that exploit pack as well. Now, one point of mitigation here is that in Android 4.03, and then really in Android 4.1, we introduced address space layout randomization or ASLR support. ASLR randomizes location of variables and functionality in memory each time a process starts. It was introduced to Android 4.03, but it didn't become good until Android 4.1. So there is an extra mitigation barrier here that we don't have a lot of details on. ASLR does make it much harder to deliver exploits, we are seeing some people talking about bypassing ASLR, which I'll talk about as well, but if you have a device older than Android 4.1, then you really don't have any defense against the stage for um, uh, exploits, against any exploits that might come out in the future. But if you're running earlier than Android 4.1, you probably have lots of other problems as well. So I don't know if stage fright is the biggest of your concerns, but definitely ASLR is helping us with some of the mitigation opportunities here. Now, we also know Zimperium has stated that they will release their exploit in 10 days. On 824, 10 days from now, they're going to release their exploit for testing purposes. Um, unless another exploit is uh, observed in the wild first, if Zimperium sees somebody else says, unlock the secret sauce, they have a working exploit, then they've said that they will release their exploits as well. We do know that people are working on bypassing ASLR, and it's not unheard of for people to find ways around ASLR. I was doing some searching, and, and I don't know uh, the, the person at bits-please.blogspot.com, 
uh, I, I, I don't know how to pronounce his little Twitter handle there, um, but he is claiming that he has found a info leak vulnerability in media server. Now that's important because an info leak vulnerability would allow somebody to find out what the addresses of memory look like so they could come up with a reliable exploit. Now um, he's saying watch his blog for more information. I've been watching his blog, haven't seen anything about that yet, but this is a big issue. 950 million vulnerable devices is prime real estate for somebody to develop a working exploit here. We have to assume people are working on this. We know some people are talking about publicly. We have to assume other people are working on it as well. Now, from a vulnerability detection side, there are applications from the Google Play Store that you can run on your Android devices, and they can tell you if you're vulnerable to the stage fright uh, vulnerability. The, there's an app from Lookout Mobile uh, called Stage Fright Detector. In Zimperium, Josh Drake's company uh, also released a tool called Stage Fright Detector, and they both can do some analysis. They both can say, are you vulnerable or are you not vulnerable to stage fright at different degrees of, of accuracy. The Zimperium tool actually identifies the different CVE numbers. So you can get these tools, you can run them. It's not the most optimum situation because we're, we're doing this kind of testing on a one-off basis, but if you want to do some quick testing, you can do that. I do want to point out, I ran both of those analysis tools through a packet capture process. I ran it through a burp suite to be able to see what kind of traffic they're generating. The Lookout tool does not send any traffic to an upstream server. Terrific. The Zimperium tool does do some mild data harvesting, and I have a screenshot here. When you run the application, they find a couple of simple attributes about what's going on in your system. They characterize whether your device is vulnerable, um, some basic fingerprint information that talks about your platform, the version information, and then specific vulnerability markers for each of the individual CVE vulnerabilities that Josh Trick identified in Stage Fright. So like Brian was saying earlier, apps do harvest information. We would not call that a malicious application, but you might also not get the warm fuzzies about it harvesting information from your system. Now in Zimperium's defense, they do say that they collect some information, they are disclosing it to you. I just want to show you exactly what they are harvesting. Okay, so what about countermeasures? What can we do about this vulnerability? Well, the classic advice, the thing that we've seen from lots of media sources, is disable auto-retrieval of MMS messages. Yes. We want to make sure our devices are configured so that when a malicious MMS, if it should arrive to a vulnerable user's device, it does not trigger the stage fright vulnerabilities in that library automatically. Now this is a little bit harder uh, done than, than actually said. Um, depending on the MMS tool that you're using, and it could be messages, messaging, messenger, hangouts, you know, messaging plus, I, I don't know, I just made that up. But there's so many different MMS messaging tools out there that the directions for configuring each one are frankly quite confusing and I, I don't think most people even know what MMS tool they're using. Fortunately, uh, the good folks at Lookout Mobile have uh, put together a terrific blog post that I found, I linked to the bottom on the page there, where they describe with wonderful illustrated screenshots for each of the four messages, messaging, messenger, and handouts, how to disable that auto retrieval of MMS messages. This is all wonderful advice, and if we can disable that on our individual devices or figure out a way we can use our MDM or EMM solutions to be able to push that out on a broader scale throughout our organization, wonderful. That, that helps us tremendously. Again, it doesn't help if the exploit vector comes through a web browser, which, which we talked about earlier. And I'm a little skeptical if this is really going to stop end users from clicking on an MMS, particularly if there are kittens on the cover thumbnail of that incoming movie, I think people are going to click on it anyway. Just this, the kittens thing puts people over the edge, they go a little crazy and they start tapping on things they don't even know what's going on. This is also a concern if this vulnerability should go to a massive propagation scale. Now if I were a malware author, what I would do is I would write this malware such that it infects somebody's machine and or their Android device and then it retrieves all their contacts and then for each person in their contact, it retrieves a little bit of information from previous SMS conversations and then uses that 
you know, keyword and then sends the message from the infected device to all the people in that contact book. Disabling auto retrieval of MMS does not help mitigate that situation because the message is coming from a trusted insider, somebody that's in their contact book, because keywords are used from past conversations, which makes the message look even more practical and not spoofed because it's uh, using a piece of information that can only come from that person or from that person's device, I think it's going to put people over the edge even without pictures of kittens to uh, be able to open these messages. So let's talk about patching here. So far, Samsung, HTC, LG, Sony, Motorola, and Android One, all big Android vendors have announced patches or plans to patch which is terrific. We've not heard anything as of a couple days ago when I last checked, we've not heard anything from ZTE, Kyocera, Intel Corporation, and other Android manufacturers that are also vulnerable and, and they're not speaking up about this. So we don't know what their status is. We believe them to be vulnerable, but they're not responding uh, with all of the other publications that folks are going through. So I know I, I just got a, a, a DM on, on Twitter, um, so a, a friend was telling me, you know, as if by magic you go into the webcast and I get a patch on my device, which is terrific. Some handset manufacturers are already releasing patches to resolve this vulnerability. Now, the big issue is if and when will more people get these patches? And who's going to get a patch and who's not going to get a patch? If you're a third-party ROM patcher person using Cyanogen Mod or something like that, the V12.1 version of Cyanogen Mod, uh, the nightly builds are already patched for that. So if you're hacking your Android device, you're loading those third-party ROMs, good on you. That is not a solution for the rest of us, but, but that's terrific and, and you can take action today. So here's the bottom line. So reflecting on this, reading everything I could consume about this, going through tons and tons of issues, and, and stage fright happens to be a, a common thing for people actually on a stage, and, and you see all these collisions on Twitter. After going through all that stuff, here's the bottom line. Many millions of Android users will be vulnerable for many years to come. Which, which is kind of scary. Consider just you know a, a, an easy swatch of users. Everybody running Android Jelly Bean, that's Android 4.1 to Android 4.3. Jelly Bean has been abandoned by Google from a vendor support perspective. No more patches for Jelly Bean, no more security fixes. Even the handset vendors themselves are no longer supporting this platform. The last time we saw an update for Jelly Bean is uh, July 2013. Now, you might say, Jelly Bean isn't like an old history. Sure it is, but it's 30.1% of Android users. That's 30%. That's about 286 million users, assuming 1 billion total Android user population. No patches, no support, nada, go buy a new phone. That's your only recourse here. And that's only Jelly Bean devices. I fully believe many, many KitKat users will not get patches either. And I think that number, 286 million devices, is going to grow to be much larger, where vendors are saying, it's too costly for us to support you. Google is saying, it's too costly for us to continue supporting you. Your only choice is to get a new phone. And then for those people that don't, they will just remain vulnerable for a long time. So here's my two conclusions that I, this has led me to. Number one, the Android security model is broken. Now, a, a lot of you are probably saying, you know, no kidding, Sherlock. Yeah, we, we knew that, okay? Yes, there are many problems with the Android security model, and I'm going to articulate a couple of things more about that. But it also led me to this second conclusion, which I think is even more important, that stage fright is the best thing that has ever happened to Android users. Now, let me back that up with a couple of important things. Number one, today, just today, I, you know, I'm drinking my coffee, I'm, I'm looking at the events of the morning, I'm get, getting myself pressed for this webcast today, and then I'm spewing coffee on my keyboard because Google did something that is unheard of. They actually released security vulnerability notice information. It, it, was, it was like a gift, it was, and I'm so happy for this. Now, you're probably saying to yourself, like, the monthly reports that we've been getting from Microsoft since 1997. Yes, just like that. 
Google has always refrained, at least for the Android line, from doing any public security notice information. So vulnerabilities would come out, the media would talk about them. We didn't know if they were right or not. There was no official source of information for vulnerability data. Well, now there is. And, and I thank Josh Drake for that and Zimperium Labs because this is a needed change. It's a Google group. Which, which is frankly not my preferred medium, but, but that's okay, we'll take what we can get, and now there is an official place to look at for security news on Android devices, which I'm so pleased about that, I, I'm, I'm, I just wanted to share that with everybody. Here's something else, more good news. On the Samsung blog, the official gold, uh, the official, I'm sorry, global blog of, of Samsung, they say that Samsung will implement a new Android security update process that fast tracks security patches over the air. These security updates will take place regularly about eh, once per month. That The inflection there was, was mine, okay? This is tremendous news. Even Apple doesn't commit to patching things once per month, and they, and they, and they love their products. You know they love their products. Now we have vendors, Google, Samsung, and LG have all pledged to make monthly security updates available. Now that's, that's, that's good, right? That's, that's good. It's awesome news. This is tremendous. Handset manufacturers are now going into the 21st century, and they're implementing patching and update and distribution processes that are just, you know, what we expect. It's, it's amazing. I'm so glad to see this. If you're a customer and you're buying an Android device, then you should be looking for things like this. It's not just the size of the battery, the screen size, the, the, the crappy apps that come with your device that nobody likes or uses anyway. No, it should be stuff like this. Monthly security updates. Vendors saying, we are committed to use a customer to provide you updates on a monthly basis. That's tremendous. That's wonderful. Why should I buy a phone from HTC, Android One, Sony, Kyocera, ZTE, Motorola, Intel? Why should I buy a phone from any of those vendors when they can't support me with regular updates? This is tremendous. I, I, I will continue buying phones from Samsung and LG and, and probably not these other vendors, myself personally. Sadly, not, not everything is rosy here. If you skim to the bottom of that article on the Samsung blog page there, and I have the URL for the article on the bottom of my slide here, it says, Samsung is, and the bold part's important, currently in conversation with carriers around the world to implement the new approach. Okay, so, you know, I, I thought, well, okay, I wish that was more predominantly stated, but, so I kept looking around, and I looked at the LG blog, and, and, and uh, you know, I saw this link on uh, androidguys.com, and, and they said, um, this is what LG said in their statement, LG will be providing security updates on a monthly basis, which carriers will then be able to make available to customers immediately. Now, that's not passive voice, but it's not really actively stated either. Um, what they're saying is we are committed to making updates happen and to get those updates to you, but hey, we are not the only problem here. What is the problem? It's the carriers. It's the carriers that are standing between your handset and your handset manufacturer that are a problem area for the distribution of all these patches. So if we consider the Android security fix process, consider at the top here, Z, Zimperium disclosed a flaw to Google. Google got it fixed in the stage fright library, terrific. And then they make that patch available to Motorola, to LG, and to Samsung, and those vendors have to integrate their third-party software, and then Samsung has to then take all those images and give it to the mobile operators, your AT&T, your T-Mobile, your Verizon, your Sprint. Then those carriers have to integrate their third-party software before they actually get it out to Android users. Where this is breaking down previously is in the Moda LG Samsung level. And that seems to be fixed, or, or that's turning around. Not fixed, but turning around, and that's getting better but it's the carrier issue. It's the carriers that are not making those updates available to end customers. Here's the bottom line. When you buy a phone from Samsung or from LG, 
You are giving that person money. You, you, you are paying for that phone, and that's tremendous. But Samsung and LG don't really have any more financial recourse. They don't get any more money for you continuing to use the phone. So every time there's an update, every time there's some kind of a security flaw, that costs them money to be able to give that update to you. Now they're finally realizing that if they're not going to support their customer security updates, they're going to lose those customers. And good on them, I won't buy a phone from HTC until they say that they are going to commit to a regular security update process. That's tremendous. The, the problem is with the carriers. The carriers also don't have any financial recourse to continue supporting your device. That's costly to them. That becomes, your phone becomes more of a cost center for them to maintain. They make money when you buy a handset. They do not make money when they have to keep pushing out monthly updates to address vulnerabilities on the platform. They have no financial recourse or reward to continue supporting your Android devices. And this has been a problem since day one in the Android model. And people like Apple have looked back and laughed because they realized this. Now, there is some shining hope. There is, there is a shining ray of light. And her name is AT&T and Sprint. A little bit, okay? I never thought I would say that. We are seeing some messaging from carriers where they're saying, we're joining with these handset manufacturers and we're making updates available. And now AT&T and, and uh, my friend on Twitter I was talking to a couple of minutes ago, he was saying, oh, you know, I, he has a, a phone, a, a Galaxy S6, just got a patch. Um, uh, Key, our moderator, we were talking, he just got a patch on his device for the phone that he bought three months ago, two months ago. This is good. We are getting updates to devices, but it's leaving out a huge area of users. The most recent devices are getting patches, but all the older devices are not. So what we're seeing is AT&T and Sprint are leading the charge over Verizon and T-Mobile, and AT&T and Sprint are saying, yes, we're going to support these devices, but only the devices that you've bought in the last 14 months, which as far as they're concerned right now, is a couple LG phones and the Samsung Galaxy S5 and the S6 and, and the, uh, the variants of those two platforms. Those are the devices that are being supported. Now, now you're probably looking at your phone and saying, but, but I have an S4 and I bought it 16 months ago and, and no patch updates for me? No, sorry, you, you need to buy a new phone. It's a little early to say how this is all going to play out, but right now, very recent devices are getting updates and everybody else is in a wait and see position. Now, the, the, the big exception to that is anybody with a Nexus phone. Because Google is responsible for hardware and software in, in that model, and they're excluding the barrier of the carrier for getting those patches to you, Google is much more rapidly pushing out updates to the next line of devices. So if you're saying to yourself, well, how do I get the best lifetime from a security patch perspective on an Android device? You buy an Android device from the manufacturer that does not have to work through a carrier to get you updates. And today, that is only Google with the Nexus line. Okay. So, uh, this is all interesting. I, I find this fascinating, but what is the practical advice? What do we do? Users should be contacting their mobile operators. You should be calling your Verizon, you should be calling T-Mobile, AT&T, and Sprint, and you should be saying, I bought this device X number of months ago, I want security updates for my device. Right now, those device manufacturers, if I had to guess, those device manufacturers and those carriers are thinking, maybe we don't have to patch those guys and they'll just buy new phones in a couple of months. Personally, I find that unacceptable, and, and I think everybody with these devices should be contacting their carriers to saying, we, we expect this level of support for being a customer. Now, you should also consider the support that you get when you buy your next phone, both who you're getting the phone from and, and carrier perspective, but also the handset model that you choose. If you want that patch management, you want that update, 
then I strongly recommend the Nexus line. It, it's hard to argue with this logic. I have no love for the particular hardware platform. It's not my favorite Android handset in the world, but they have a rollout model that is far better than what any other handset vendor and carrier can actually offer. In fact, the model that Nexus offers is, is almost as good, almost as an iPhone. Now, I use an iPhone. I sometimes make fun of Android users too. It's kind of a rivalry that we have. It's like VI and Emacs. It's like Chrome or Firefox because nobody uses Internet Explorer anymore. It's, it's that kind of a rivalry that we've got going on. But, but let me point out a tangent point. Whatever you think of the iOS platform, whether you like the apps, you like the hardware, you, you don't like the non-removable battery, you don't like the Apple tax, the extra $200 you have to pay for an iPhone to get comparable features to an Android phone, whatever you think about Apple, they still support the iPhone 4S. And the iPhone 4S came out in October 2011. That's almost four years of support for a handset. Why is Apple still supporting this ancient handset? I mean, you would see somebody with that phone and you'd be like, oh, is your contract not up? It's, it's time to get a new phone. Here's the reason. Apple gets 30% of everything you buy in that handset, whether it's a $1 app, 30 cents to Apple, whether it's a song on iTunes, whether it's a movie rental out of iTunes, whether it's an in-app purchase for a bucket full of gems in your favorite game, Apple gets 30% of everything. They have the financial motivation to continue supporting these devices long into the future. So when you look at total cost of ownership, if you're willing to stick around with a device for a couple of years, the iPhone is, is the better choice. I know there are many applications that won't run on iOS. There's things that I want to do in iOS and I can't, that you can do on Android devices. I'm not arguing that you should take the iOS approach, but their model is hard to argue with. Okay, so just to conclude here, stage fright, in my opinion, is a considerable threat. We don't know a lot yet. In 10 days, Imperium will release their exploit code, and uh, you can uh, follow my Twitter feed. I'm going to be talking about that as I analyze that source code to figure out how practical it is, opportunities to bypass ASLR, and turn it into a practical exploitation vector against more than just the people that are running archaic pre-4.1 Android devices. You can get apps from Lookout and Zimperium to detect the threats. You can disable MMS, but that does not solve your entire problem. And finally, Android is amazing. It's an amazing platform. The power is a developer, and I write Android apps. I've written probably 18 Android apps that I use for all sorts of different functionality. You know, I love Android as a platform, but this patching model has got to go. Fundamentally, the carrier, the handset vendor, and Google are not coordinating sufficiently to be able to get these mandatory security fixes into the, end, the hands of end users, and ultimately you pay the price for that. Now, uh, you can always go to sins.org slash webcast slash archive to be able to get archives of this webcast or any past webcasts, and I wanted to make my slides available there as well, and those are up right now if you want to grab them, and I know Keith is going to make the presentation available, uh, I think, an hour after we're done here today, so please share this. Uh, pass it among your colleagues, pass it along your coworkers, and, uh, you know, I'd love to hear any questions on any of the topics that we've talked about. And so uh, with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it over to uh, Brian, and, and I think we're going to go to a little bit of QA. Brian? Unmuted. All right. Uh, thanks, Josh. Our first question is, how does Veracode integrate with Mobile Iron? Yep, sure. This is Brian. I can take that. So our integration is actually muted. There's a configuration item uh, in the settings for Mobile Iron. You just provide your credentials, and essentially apps start flowing in. App analysis results start flowing in to the MDM dashboard, from which you can start uh, building policies and, and taking actions. So it's very easy to, to turn on. Unmuted. The next question is: Is this vulnerability a self-replicating exploit? 
Oh, well, I, I can take that one, Brian. So, um, so far, we've not seen any evidence of that. Muted. The, the only exploit that we're seeing from uh, Josh Drake is uh, the simple Python example that he posted on YouTube. It doesn't appear to have any self-propagating properties. Um, but, uh, you know, if we kind of step back and reflect on it, the level of privilege that you get on an Android device having successfully gotten a shell with stage fright, and then um, combined with other vulnerabilities, there's a couple of new root exploits, there's a couple of privilege escalation exploits that we recently learned about from the Black Hat and DEF CON conferences last week. Um, you know, it's uh, possible that this could turn into something that's self-replicating. The, the big gate right now, and I, and I don't want to frighten people, I'm not, I'm not trying not to say the, the W word, um, but the, the big gate here is whether or not ASLR can be reliably bypassed. Today, we don't have any information on that, so we, we really just don't know. Um, but it, should somebody find a way to bypass ASLR, then yeah, I, I think this could be turned into something self-propagating, but that's a big if that, that we don't know the answer to yet. Great question. Unmuted. The next question is, how do MDMs like AirWatch and Mobile Iron protect from stage fright? Brian, do you want me to take that? or? Yeah, I'll, this is Brian. I'll take a pass at it. So, Muted. the I would say the MDMs inherently don't have protections, and I think what Josh walked through today in terms of potential protections are, are essentially your, your best bet. I don't know, Josh, if you want to continue on from that. Yeah, I think they, uh, so far, the only software that I've seen that claims to defend against stage fright is the Zimperium IDS or IPS, the ZIPS software, that's Imperium cells. Uh, as far as I've seen, and I checked a bunch of the blogs for um, AirWatch and, and Mobile Iron and, and Good and, and a bunch of other folks, I'm not seeing any evidence that they have the ability to defend against this uh, library level vulnerability. What they do offer, though, is the ability to inventory your deployment of Android devices, where the version is on all these devices, um, and then uh, possibly some devices can even say what MMS software you've installed, the version of that application. So that can be useful for identifying the threat, but apart from that Zimperium IPS software, we have not seen any MDM software or client-side defense software that can mitigate this attack. Unmuted. The next question is for Josh. Josh, vulnerabilities in various platforms are increasing in frequency and potential impact, and the potential impact is the industry going to work to improve the quality of their products or continue to provide questionable products and services to unsuspecting slash non-technical consumers? Uh, Muted. So uh, just, just to restate the question, uh, we, we see more bugs. Uh, are we going to keep producing shoddy software with lots of bugs, or is the industry going to change and produce higher quality software? Unmuted. Well, muted. A very complicated question with no easy answer. I I would like to cast a shout out to Brian because I think Vericode is doing awesome stuff, and I think they are helping identify that shoddy software um, in 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 different ways to be able to help organizations at least recognize it and and, and address it through different tools. So I think that's wonderful. Um, I think that. In the Android ecosystem and, and also in the iOS ecosystem, there is a push to get apps out the door. You know, I tell my students there's about a thousand new apps approved per day in both the Google Play Store and the Apple App Store, um, the iOS App Store. So that's a lot of apps, and I, 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 this is empirical observation, but I'm going to go on a limb and say a lot of them completely suck. They're just they're just bad. Um, so yeah, I think that there are different motivators. Um, I think Stage Fright is really interesting because it's a critical system library. It's been around since Android 2.2, and apparently nobody's looked at it carefully enough until Josh Drake decided, I want to pick a core library that affects 950 million Android devices, audit it, and now, oh, I found exploitable code. You know, um, I get upset when I see Josh Drake um, vilified here, 
um, because I think through this effort, he's done more to improve the security of Android than has happened in many, many years. But I think we will continue to see crappy software going forward too. Unmuted. And our last question is, do we know if stage fright or equivalent affects iOS? You want to take that one, Brian? Yeah, go ahead. Muted. So, um, a few months ago, there was um, an SMS exploit for iOS devices that was a vulnerability in font rendering that would crash Springboard. Springboard is the application in iOS which handles locking and unlocking the device, scrolling through your apps, the wiggle when you move apps around, that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I know myself personally that lots of my quote-unquote friends sent me that text message to crash my iOS device on a frequent basis. Um, the difference was that vulnerability in iOS was not an exploitable vulnerability other than it's now a service attack. It was annoying. Um, Apple, in my humble opinion, took their sweet time correcting it, um, and then it was corrected. But we all got the patches because Apple makes patches available for all of their supported devices, even though the 4S is four years old and, and everything afterward. There is no stage fright library. That code is not shared on iOS. It's not like WebKit or something that's shared commonly across multiple platforms. So this vulnerability does not affect iOS specifically. Uh, we've seen other vulnerabilities that just not have been quite as bad. The iOS vulnerability could have been this bad, um, but the resolution would have been much swifter than what we're going to see on the Android side. Unmuted. And with that, we are out of time. So thank you so much, Josh and Brian, for your great presentation, and you, Ver Vericode, for sponsoring this webcast, which helps bring this content to this hands community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcast, webcasts, including this one, you can visit sans.org forward slash webcast. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.